with me to Romans 5, and we're going to start the second half of Romans 5, <clears throat> beginning with verse 12. And I think I'll just read it for you to begin with. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, Many be dead, much more. Anybody recognize that little phrase, much more? Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. <clears throat> and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> All right, the biggest thing to notice in here is that everything is based on one, and everything flows out of one. Everything is based on one man, and it is based on, it is, it is setting forth, apart from all of the theology that these things are setting forth, it is constantly setting forth the heart of God in relationship to oneness. That his heart always was that through oneness, this thing would happen. Through being one with him, you'll enter the promised land. Through being one with him, you'll, you know, the, the, the return will take place. Um, through being one with him, the atonement will be fulfilled. <clears throat> um, and so, um, uh, theologically that's correct, but more importantly, according to the Lord's heart, this was his plan. Oneness was his plan. Not just oneness to save us from everything Adam did, but oneness, period, is, again, the promised land. <clears throat> And so he is setting this forth, but then, you know, the, the question arises from, you know, people that ask, well, you know, kind of like over in Romans 9 uh, where it talks about the potter. Well, if the potter made us to be this way, then why are we to blame? <clears throat> you know, this would be more your fault or whatever. But in his heart, he's saying, it came through one man, Adam, but that was never the plan. The plan was always that you would join with me and then in joining with me, everything that was supposed to happen would come by life and by uh, the flow of that oneness between us. Um, and so, and I'm gonna just, you know, I'm gonna say it like this. And so, um, and again, I'm not, I'm speaking for God in the sense of that I'm saying it as if he said it. I'm not speaking for God in that this is definitive 
But he would say, from what I, the, the approach I'm taking, I allowed oneness to be abused, but that was never the goal or the intention. And I always, I always wanted this union before there was sin, as seen in Adam and Eve and how God brought that about and how, you know, God's creating and he's moving and he's, he says in the first day God created this and that and it was good. And the second day he created this and that and it was good. And the third day he created this and that and the, on and on until after all of that and before sin, before Satan, before there was ever a sin and before Satan ever showed up, God said there's something that's not good. Everything's been good up to this point, but there's something that's not good. And that is that he doesn't have a mate. He doesn't have, here's the scriptural way. He doesn't have one after his kind. And we're going to bring that about, but we're going to bring that through a, a deep sleep, which in the Hebrew there means as deep like un, unto death. Put Adam to sleep. We're going to open him up. And in this death and in this wounding, we're going to bring forth a bride. <clears throat> again, back to Genesis. Again, beginnings. Again, finding the heart of God in these things instead of whatever it is that we keep finding and realizing that, you know, this for him to say by one man, the one thing that was in his heart was that I would be the one. I would be the one whether you sinned or not. That that was my plan. And that my decision for that was not faulty, it was love. It was not faulty. In your mind, men of the earth going, well, then you made us one with Adam and then we sinned and, did it, and this is all your fault. And, you know, and there's several places in the New Testament that such things are brought up. And... You know, again, I can't answer for God, but I just hear what was always in his heart before the fall and before all of that. And if we could have only found him, you know, if we could only find him, if we could still only find him, find him, find the real one that we call God, not just label him Jesus and say that's it but find the being behind it, and then you know Jesus, you know, and, and call in Jesus the one that does all this good stuff for me. That is not a good definition of Jesus. I'm sorry, he is a, he is a good God, but most of the time we say God is good all the time. But basically, we're talking about what he does for me. And what if he's not good, or at least not good in our estimation? All things work together for good, but not all things are good. And some of the things that work together are wounds to the side to bring forth, or, or, or a, a sleep like an unto death from which there will be a resurrection because it's not death, meaning the type and shadow with Adam. And so to, um, for us, not, not just them, you know, for us to uh, press past the veil and the veiled people in Hebrews was his flesh, was his earth life and all that he did and all that. And, and all that he said, and you say, well, that's crazy. The new, the epistles after the gospels, 
they hardly ever mention one of Jesus' miracles. They don't mention this thing or that thing or the time he remember when he did this. And let's use this as an example. They don't bring them up at all. They don't bring up any, any deliverances that he does. They don't bring up basically anything that he did. And it is even barely mentioned his words of what he taught. I don't know if you realize it. I mean, if I dare you to just go check that out. I dare you to just do it. And you'll just be shocked. And so theologians say, well, the Gospels are the only true thing because it's about Jesus. Who's this Paul guy? You know, he don't, you know. And so they discount it and they say, besides, he's preaching a just different gospel than what Jesus preached. Jesus preached healing and this and that and whatever. Well, Jesus didn't preach that. Jesus preached the kingdom of God, the government of God, and the only way to bring that back down is that if, unless I die as a seed, I'm going to be the only one governed this way. But if I can bring forth after my kind, there will be much fruit to the glory of the, the father, the husbandman. <clears throat> and so I, I say all that to say that veil, that veil <clears throat> is his flesh. It says that. That veil, and that's what's blocking our view of seeing him as he is. That's what it says. It is blatantly screaming that we have to get past, you know, I mean, I mean even, you know, Paul even said it. We, we once knew Jesus after the flesh, but we know him no more in that way. But that, you know, that veil's rent. That ship sailed. And now we're knowing the heart that brought about all this. We're knowing, um, we're knowing the unknown God. We're knowing the unknown about him. Okay, well, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, When the heart turns to the Lord, the, the veil is rent. Our definition of the heart turning to the Lord is to the one that will do miracles or heal or help. And I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying, I'm trying, to just, I'm trying to just declare what the scriptures say and what I believe to be the heart of the Lord because it doesn't say when the veil is rent then everything glorious happens. It says you see him and you're changed to that. I mean, that, is that so bad? You know? Is that so horrible to pursue the thing that will change us? Well, what's that? Not knowing him after the flesh and claiming we know Jesus. You know, I, I've used it as an example before, but, you know, if, you, if there was a carpenter and he did wonderful woodworking and he was just exquisite and just amazing, and you'd say, oh, you're just an amazing man. And the things you do, I've never seen anybody. And you're so creative. And, and it just seems so to flow from beauty. I mean, I've known, I've known musicians that way. And then people just go, oh, my God, you know. But the, the carpenter, the musician, they go home, they beat their wife, and they beat their kids, and they treat them bad and everything. And, and nobody ever knows because they're a horror to live with. You don't really know him by the work of his hands. Not really. You may know talent. And a lot of Christians have talent. But it shouldn't be being pawned off as life and spirit and him. Just him. Anyway, so... Um, <coughs> Getting our heart to turn to the Lord doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens by confrontation. It's called the law of contrast. The law of contrast is a, it is, I learned about the law of contrast when I was in Bible school. And even, I think it was today, I think it was today, as I was doing just a little bit of searching, this law of contrast kicks in 
and I see the contrast of what we think or what I think compared to what he thinks, and it confronts my theology, it confronts what I hold as dear, and I have to, I have to yield. Not, he doesn't have to yield. I'm not making him in my image. I have to yield and I have to say, you know, my doctrine is not my own. What did you say? How did you say that? But it's not doctrine. You know, the word doctrine really just means teaching. I mean, it really is the translation of it. But we've made doctrine, you know, stead, unmovable teachings that don't require life or Jesus or anything. And so there's this, <clears throat> so I'm confronted with the law of contrast. It's like light shines in my darkness. And that's really what it's saying there in 2 Corinthians, you know. 2 Corinthians 4 moves on into that, that the light shines into darkness. And it's taken from creation. And it's quoted in Jeremiah. And it is so powerful in Jeremiah because he sees, he's dealing with, with, with the Jews who are off on their perception of God. They, they're not off on their doctrine. Sure they are, but that's not the issue. They're not off on their teachings. They're not off on their um, uh, rituals. They're not off on this and that. They're off on their perception of God, which means that they have left the original intention of his heart. You leave that, you don't have, you don't have the true God anymore. I don't, I'm just telling you, I'm talking about from his side. I'm not talking about whether we're going to be saved or not, or, oh, we should go into fear then, or all this kind of stuff. I'm just saying, if that's his heart, and he's going, I, w I would like for you to perceive me correctly. Just know me. Stop looking at what I do and calling that me. Find me. And, and, you w and he says this, and you will find me if you seek for me with all your heart. But no, man, we can't do that because we have jobs or something. You know, I don't know. I'm telling you, you can have a job. You can work. I'm telling you, <laughs> you you say, well, right now you don't. I did. I worked for Denton State School, and you wouldn't believe what I had to carry on. And, and three or four of the best books I ever wrote, I wrote right there in that classroom. And never, and, and then got an award at the end of the year for achieving the most in the classroom. How did you do that? With, especially with mentally retarded kids. you're going to have to get your heart after the Lord. It's not based on, you know, well, I, I've got to have time and I don't have any time. It's not about time. It's about heart. If you don't have heart, all the time in the world is not going to fix anything. But heart shows up when you don't have time. Did you know that? If you were in love and, and your schedule was such that you couldn't be with the one you loved, if you got two minutes with them, it could be like heaven. It just would be everything. Unforgettable if you got heart. You know, one glance that is true can keep you going for a long time. The Lord says, come to the throne of grace. Come with a true heart. Come, And that true heart can't be false. Does that make sense? It can't, it can't be a false heart. It can't be a fake, you know, oh, I love you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. You know, just stop it. Just the best thing to do, go out and just get involved in rank sin. And then if you get sick of it, come back. You shouldn't be telling them that, brother. If you don't, if you don't do it yourself, God's going to end up sending you into Babylon. Oh, I, I want, I want more quail. Well, I'll give you quail till it's coming out your nose, and then you'll come back and go, okay, enough of the quail. Can we go back to the manna thing? 
You know, the, by the way, the quail was from earth. The manna was from heaven. You say, well, yeah, but it, it's not that much. It's, that's, the diet never changes. It's, it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Could we, you know, could we eat something tasty? Sure. Just ask him for it. Lord, give us quail. <laughs> They sell it at Sack and Save. You heard that here first on TV, folks. <laughs> All right, I'm not getting very far here. Um, so, yeah. So I, I put down oneness is the issue all along in his heart. So really, be honest with me. Then why would we talk about anything else? If we're bored with that subject, then we're going to get jaded. And if we get jaded, then we're going to get to a point where we, we don't listen. We can't, he we can't even hear it. We don't li first, we don't listen, the habit of not listening. And then, second of all, it may actually be God this time. And we miss. We miss it. We miss God. And we meant well, but we miss God. Is that worth it? Is that worth it? So... Return to my original plan, Jesus would say. Me. <laughs> and then I wrote down, all he asks is for oneness. By one man, da-da-da-da. Yes, by one man, this happened. Right by one man, he's talking about himself. You know, so we go, we hear him. It's like Jesus standing up here. Where he wrote this. He gave it to Paul to put it down. And it's like Jesus standing up there going, by one man, and in his heart he's going, I'm the man, and you be joining me. And we get, theologically, it was by one man that this happened, and by this and that. And we look right past him into a teaching. And, it, and the scriptures, I mean, Romans 5, the second half, is screaming, oneness, I want oneness, just come to me and everything will blossom from there. So then we get serious, and then we start we start praying and reading our Bible and trying to get right. Did you hear what I said? Doing that, trying to get right, trying to get right. Our heart's not right, but we're trying to get right, and that doesn't lead there either. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know. A bride prepares herself for oneness differently than a Christian prepares himself for oneness. I mean, excuse the vulgar turn, but a bride is preparing herself for him in her. That's what he wants, and that's what is going to bring about this union together. And so we're, we're preparing, you know, we put on stuff. You know, oh, I need, to, I need to be more like this. I need to, you know. I mean, come on. Maybe I'm more Texan or something. Than, but, you know, you go, you, it's your wedding night, and she puts on stuff for you. And all you can think about is, we need to take all this stuff off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, isn't that right? It's like. It's like, uh, all this that you've done is hindering what the plan is. <laughs> it's the truth. And we, you know, and so he's looking at her, and he's thinking, we need to remove everything that cannot become one with me, and clothes can't become one with me. Do you understand, do you understand the concept? But okay, so no, no, I'm going to put on makeup and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put on a nighty and I'm going to get my hair perfect and, you know, it's either all coming off or going to be rearranged before morning. <laughs> it's all, it's, that's the plan. That's what he's thinking about. You say, well, the Lord's not that way. I got news for you. He made all this stuff. You know, we go, well, it's sinful. Oh, God. 
you know, you don't understand. But it, it, it comes from a reality of his heart. It was made in shadow land, and it doesn't mean anything unless we find the real reality of that. So we live as Christians, and we never let him fill us up with his life, and we never let it be Christ, because, and we never live as a bride. We don't even know how to live as a bride. We're so busy trying to, to put on stuff again, to make ourselves acceptable when, again, all he can think of is, uh, this, stu I, this stuff has got to go. That's what he's, it's got to go. It's not the plan. If you can just see that in the way that you approach the Lord, it would help. I know, uh, you know, yes, okay, it's vulgar and I'm a bad man. But the truth is, if you can see this in the way of the Lord, you would stop doing certain things that you think is going to make you look pretty to him. You know, oh, he's going to really like me looking this way. When he's, like, he's going, look, it's you, not that stuff. If you need it or want it right now, but you need to know, you know, here's the deal. If you need it or want it, fine. But you need to know I don't need it or want it. Because I can't become one with makeup. And that's what we're doing, isn't it? We're making up ourselves. We're putting on makeup. We're, we're putting on things on us that we think is going to just, oh, he's going to love this. And everything, the, the, the scales to him are not measured by all those things that we think is going to please him. They're measured by oneness. They're measured by oneness. That's all that is, is the thing that's going to make everything. By one man, by his death, many. And there's the principle, isn't it? Life out of death. Always someone suffers and someone gains. Someone dies and someone gets the fruit of it. It's always life comes out of death. And he's saying, okay, y'all sin. I made it perfect for you in the Garden of Eden. Or Israel, I made it perfect for you. I gave you Israel the, uh, or Jerusalem, the love of my heart. And you all, in every case, turned and trampled what was most dear to my heart, and in many cases, simply because you didn't know me. You didn't really know me. You tried to please, as it were, can I say it like this, someone else. Because you were perceiving him differently than what he is, so you're trying to please someone else. And he's going, you know, you ever heard about God getting jealous? He's going, you're with someone else. You're calling it me. You're calling it me. You think that I'm going to go, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm over here. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you know. It's a blues song. It says, get with me, baby. I'm on your side. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a rebuke. It is. It's already settled. I'm with you. Now get with me. And so if you, if, you, if you approach it with a bride's heart, then your priorities change because the only thing that's important is him and what he thinks. Does that make sense? Really, really makes sense. All of a sudden you go, you know, it's, you know, Using a girl as an example, their whole life they're thinking about marriage and the man they're going to marry and what he's going to look like and what he's going to be like and you know he's he's going to be talented or he's going to be so good looking or you know this and that. All of that's when it comes to the Lord, that's idol worship. There's no need picking and choosing. I mean, it's like a smorgasbord, you know, and you go, well, I think I like that, and I like this, and let's put it all together here, and, you know, got me a nice whatever. 
And he's going, look, I'm just me. I'm just me. And if you can't love, you know, the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength, then maybe you ought to go to your idols, you know? But, folks, the good news is there were people that returned and went through terrible trials to get back to the Lord, to get out of captivity and to come be and to find the burnt stones were some of the most beautiful stones they ever saw in their life because he gave himself to keep them safe, though in captivity, so that when the time came, they could be brought back into his heart this time. A different, it's different, it's completely different. It, it's different to who? It's still Jerusalem and it's still the same stones. It's different to God. It's different to Jesus. It's different to him. And so the return is that is, is not based on we're going to have this great temple and it's going to be beautiful and the nations are going to come from all over the world and they're going to think that, you know, we're special. It's going to be picking up those stones and going, oh my God. <laughs> if, my, if I ever lose my love for Jerusalem, just you in the burnt stones you find out more about him than the glorious temple altogether altogether and you find out by one man and all of those one man things are his death his death out of what out of love 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 no i don't mean Oh, let's keep it godly love. I mean love. He loves more than we can understand. Real love. And so then you, you're, you're reading Romans 5, 12 through the end. And in every word you're saying by one man, that's you, Jesus. You won't even say by me. <laughs> you just go by one man. I hope you find him, but he's the one. You know what I'm saying? He's the one. He is that one man. And by one man's death, by one man's suffering, by one man bearing all that you did against him and all of the vileness of how you misformed him and all of the things that you did wrong, if you'll just Return to me, I've already made the way for you into my oneness and into my heart. And therefore, my oneness is going to give you everything you tried to earn by your goodness. Tree of life. The tree of life. If you ever read Proverbs about the tree of life, it'd be a tree of life. Hallelujah. All right, let's pray. Father, we just ask you to move by your spirit upon the upon the, the things of the heart of Jesus and to place them as precious jewels in our hearts. That we that we not just read his word as if it's a book, a learning tool. But that we that we stroke every verse looking for and longing for the appearing, the coming of our Lord. And that we're not waiting someday, someday in the future. We want you now, Jesus. We want you now. We want you to step off of the pages of scripture and step into the fullness of life within us. Be that life within us. Let us experience you in your fullness. No longer our concepts, 
no longer honoring and giving credence to things that only declare you Jesus, but only that which is you. Only that which truly will result in you and you in us. Father, don't let us miss this visitation of your time at our gatherings. Don't let us pass it off as secular, as perverse, as normal. Don't let our hearts remain dull. Draw us and we will run. We will run to you. We want you more than we want ourselves. Your loving kindness that you show toward us is better than life. It's better than our life before we met your loving kindnesses. Your poured out kind of love, not just feelings, but your poured out kind of love is so precious. So, Father, continue to move. Every speaker, every one, Lord, may we gather in groups. It's just standing around after church, and may something of honey from our lips be sweet to someone else. May we be your hands or your lips or your feet from which others gain more of your sweetness. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. You can... Linger if you so wish. I know some of you need to go and you, you must feel free to be able to do that.